to welcome Janet Treen to the Zoom today. And uh, Janet was awarded several awards in the Sydney Cook Show 2021 online, including first prize in the applique professional category, a hand quilting open excellence in quilting award, best of show. And then after the award ceremony, we had a viewer's choice poll and she came out top on that as well. I wanted to get you soon after the award ceremony while it was still fresh you. for you. And I know Donna was absolutely tickled to be able to deliver. I, I didn't want to open that box. I went, it's so beautifully wrapped. I kind of don't want to take the ribbon off. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed that very much. I just would like to hear more about the background to your work. This is actually your third best of show. And mm. I wondered when you first started this work, was it immediately following 2014 or was there an interlude? I did have a bit of a break from doing these big quilts. And this one I started about two and a half years ago. And that's about how long it's it's taken me to make it. I was going to put it in the show in 2020, but of course we know what happened. I'm just lucky I was able to put it in this year's virtual show. What was your jumping off point for this design? It's a very soft aesthetic and where did that originate? Well, it started with the ombre background fabric which is not one piece it goes from dark from selvage to selvage and light in the middle so I had to cut it up in order to get the effect I wanted of the dark in the middle going lighter and then dark on the outside and I was inspired by the Japanese applique artists and I have a, a friend Sashiko and I got in touch with her because I saw a quilt by Toyoko Nakajima and she had this particular medallion setting and I wanted to be able to do my own thing with that setting. So I asked Sashiko if she knew Toyoko and she said, yes, she's my, my master. <laughs> and I got permission from Toyoko to, yes, use the setting, but I drew up my own floral elements and the yellow ring going around and put my own touches to it and my own colouring to it. Well this is how I start the applique designs. I decide on the flowers that I want in the design and I've got a rough idea of the setting and how I want them arranged etc. And then I make lots of photocopies of the flowers and leaves and so on. And then I lay them out until I've got something that's pleasing to me. And I do edit along the way quite a bit, but that's the starting point. And I did use a polygraph <laughs> because there's like there's eight sections in the quilt. So I needed them evenly distributed. So I started off with the polygraph and that's what those blue, I think they're blue lines are. That's just the start of it. And then it's very repetitive from then on. And I didn't design the border until I had done quite a bit of the applique in the middle and then decided what I wanted to do there. So and that ombre fabric, it must have been quite challenging to segment that up to accommodate the circular design and the shadowing within the design as, <laughs> as well. Actually easier than you think. It's... It's giant half square triangles. So if I cut four large half square triangles and then rearrange them, that's what I ended up with in the background. It's extremely effective and it helps to just illuminate the design and draws your mm. eye to that wonderful central element of your composition there while I was making that quilt the whole time I was kind of channeling my mother my my mother is Japanese so probably that's why it appeals to me that type of work but she was a perfectionist and she kind of put that on me a bit <laughs> 
but I made her, when I started quilting, the third quilt I ever made was a pink and blue quilt. And I thought, I'm going to make this for mum. And I didn't tell her, but when I showed her the quilt, and it was back in the early 90s, so you can imagine the fabrics, she said, oh, it's so dark. And I could tell she didn't like it. And I thought, oh, no. So I thought, oh. And, you know, over time we think, oh, yeah, everyone did pink and blue quilts. That's so last year or whatever. And I've never made another one until this one. So I constantly thought of my mum. She probably wouldn't remember the incident because she's got Alzheimer's and she's very elderly and she's in New Zealand and I might never see her again. So I almost called the quilt by her name, which is Mariko, or her real name is Hachiko, but her nickname is Mariko. And so I, I was kind of, this is, like a thank you to mum for teaching me to do my best and to strive to do better and challenge myself because that's the gift she gave me. I don't count how many leaves are in that quilt, but my husband likes to. <laughs> and he estimated this probably, including the large leaves, those are the, the small ones, that go around the blue flowers but there's probably two and a half thousand leaves I applied down my goodness so, and one thing that struck me when I saw this photograph was the sheer variety of greens and the different fabrics that you've used I obviously got a combination of batiks and prints fresh <laughs> there's a lot of batiks in this quilt probably more than any other type of fabric but I do have a lot of greens because I love to do the applique and you always end up, when you do floral designs, using a lot of leaves. So yes, I just use whatever I have. And I like to use different values of green and different shades of green and colors because I think it gives a little bit of interest, gives a bit of depth. Otherwise, I think if I use the same green throughout, it would look quite flat. Are these also batiks? Yes, that's the part I find the most challenging is when you do flowers, you can't have the petals all the same colour because it'll just look like a blob. And, and those are the colours I wanted to use, the apricot, yellow, pink. I had a bit of variety to use for those and just played around with the values and, and the colours and the, and the roses and tried to get different looking roses, not just all the same. That took a long time. <laughs> One of the highlights of this work is the embroidery embellishment. And I wonder if your husband's counted the number of French knots that you've used. No way. <laughs> well, my theory is you just do, you've got to do one flower at a time and eventually they all get done. And if it's, if you enjoy what you're doing, you don't think about it as being work. You think about it as being something creative and, and playing and seeing what looks good. Just shows the scale of, the flowers but there's five petals in each of those blue flowers and there are a lot of those blue flowers in the quilt and they all have the French knots and the teeny tiny circles in the middle. I do like to do a bit of embroidery. Here you can see in the larger flowers the extra dimensionality and texture that is bought by embroidery. This also shows the cross hatching of the hand quilting in the background mm. and you've added mm. the embroidery to the leaves as well a, a lot a lot happening there <laughs> well I admire what Sandra Leitner she's a well-known American applique artist and I like what she does by adding uh, embroidery it just adds that little bit of extra interest and it seems to bring the flowers and the leaves a bit more alive and a maybe a little wee bit more realistic. I used some silk thread for inside the roses for the stamens, more French knots. <laughs> and I just think that that made the flower look just a little bit more interesting. And I enjoyed doing it. So I'm, 
I, I love adding a bit of embroidery to my applique. Not only have you got cross hatching in the centre, but you've got these wonderful, are the feathers trapunto? Is that the trapunto element? Yes, and also in the border, you can see on one side near the edge where I've put two sort of stems of leaves and trapunto those as well. And that's very subtle when I actually thought about outlining that in perhaps a dark green thread. And I thought, no, I, I like the fact that it's subtle and you have to be close up to the quilt to see it. It's just that little, little bit of something that tickled my fancy I wanted to do, but the feathers are stuffed with acrylic yarn. I have a couple of ways that I do trapunto. For this quilt, I actually had the whole quilt basted before I did the stuffing and then I did it from the back of the quilt. I'll use a tapestry needle or a blunt end needle and where that makes a hole you can just scratch it with the toothpick or the end of the needle and it closes up the hole and I think when the quilt's washed that helps close up the hole as well. Trapunto is something I really love adding to my quilts and I don't know if you can see it there but that yellow ring around the whole design that's another batik few people have said have you used a silk or something shimmery there because it looks like it glows but that's just another batik that was printed almost like like a parchment paper look and then I felt like it it melted a bit in the into the background and wasn't popping how I wanted it so I embroidered around every single one of those elements as well just to outline it and the outlining that you did was that in a colored thread just an embroidery thread and I think I used just one single thread of the DMC embroidery and did a stem stitch around the elements the binding treatment the goldy color there how was that achieved that's the technique that I got from Beth Ann Nemish, she's White Arbor Quilting, I think she is, got a DVD on that technique. And it's beads that you sew a bias strip and you put the beads inside the bias strip, fold it over, machine it down, and then you hand stitch to secure each bead between each bead. Then that's tucked in just under the binding, the bias binding on the very edge. The quilt needed that. The yellow is in the centre of the quilt. Then I've got the big yellow ring and I just felt that that yellow, a little bit on the edge there, just finished that off nicely. It certainly helps to unify and frame the design and it's mm. not too heavy. And it's interesting that you mentioned Beth Ann's finishing techniques because Catherine Jones just won Best of Show yes. in Tasmania and she has a very elaborate edge treatment on her Best of Show work at which she also yes. attributes to tutorials from Beth Ann. You can see the quilt behind you there. From memory I think it was about 195 or 190 centimetres square something like that. So we can see the circular composition and then the mm. arrangements in each corner. Did that take some while for to audition and, and work out the effect that you wanted to create? I think I could see it in my mind. I think I have the ability to be able to picture something in my mind and then I work out how I want to execute it. Sometimes those ideas don't work out and I have to do editing and or change a few things because sometimes a quilt will speak to you and say no <laughs> do something different yes Were there any moments that had you frustrated or discouraged along the way look I love every single aspect but I do have to say when I'm designing and drawing that takes a long time once you have happy with the result that you have it's, you know, you can go steaming ahead, it's good. But that, that designing part will probably take me a couple of months of quite a lot of hours, more hours than doing the quilt, but you know where you're going with it and what you're doing and you can't wait to get to the next. You mentioned about how washing may assist in sealing up the holes from the trapunto needles. Mm -hmm. 
Um, does that mean that you've actually washed this work? Yes. I always wash because I use markers that would probably horrify people, but and it's an English brand called Beryl, B-E-R-O-L, and they completely wash out, but you do have to wash the quilt quite well. And I usually soak it overnight. I always wash my quilts and then I block them. I block them before I bind them. And the blocking part of it is the part I dislike because <laughs> it's crawling around on the floor. <laughs> you're measuring all the time and you're pinning and, and so on and trying to get it as flat and straight as you can. It takes a while and it's just not enjoyable for me, but it's something that I feel I have to do. I've got those um, rubber mats I got from Kmart actually that join together like jigsaw, like uh, exercise mats. And so I just pin to those and they work really well. And I also use a level laser that has 90 degree lights as well as a diagonal light. And that's been a huge help for straightening up and making sure everything sits right. It certainly helps in the presentation and it's looking beautifully flat and square hanging behind you there minor colour runs which is another reason why I like to wash the quilts uh, to help set the colours and I use a Dylon product as well as the colour catchers and that seems to take care of that quite nicely. I would just like to say thank you to Quilt New South Wales and especially thank you to the exhibition committee who made this happen. I mean, we've been starved of quilt shows and so it was wonderful to be able to participate in that. And also thank you to the sponsors who came forward and provided awards because that was just fantastic of them to do that when we didn't have a physical show. And especially thanks to Benina for my best of show award. They're so supportive of quilters and it's very much appreciated. So thank you. And thank you. I mustn't forget the volunteers. Thank you to Sandra Lyons, who looked after my quilt for nearly five months. <laughs> the drop-off volunteers were great. Well, we're looking forward to gearing up for the Quilt New South Wales 40th anniversary in 2022. Yeah. And hopefully there'll be an opportunity then for us to share your quilt in the cloth. And uh, thank you again for making the time today to give some background. We'll see you in 2022, yeah. hopefully at a real I hope, I hope so. And you're welcome. And, and thank you for inviting me to talk about my quilt, Brenda. Mm -hmm.